All right, while we're waiting, we're just going to uh, load up another PowerPoint. Can I gauge the room? What have we got in the room? Have we got people that have played around with greening buildings in the room, like even renting in areas or owning? Yeah, cool. Uh, veggie gardens. Cool. Yeah, very nice. Cool, cool. Little uh, potted plants in the house, little babies. Yeah, good, good. <laughs> Testing. All right, good. Is there any architects or... Um... Oh, yeah, cool. All right. I think we can, we can introduce everyone. We can just ask. <laughs> yeah, well. <laughs> All right. Hi, everyone. Uh, firstly, I'd like to acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Eora, Eora Nation, the traditional custodians of this land, and pay my respects to elders both past and present. Uh, so my name is Scott Sherwood. I'm the uh, National Maintenance Manager for Fighter Green. Um, I essentially manage all of our projects after installation um, across Australia. Um, I come from a horticultural background rather than construction, so if you do have any questions on plants, more than happy to uh, answer those as well. Uh, I've been a horticulturalist for about 20 years. I, originally from Sydney, started out as an apprenticeship over at Sydney Olympic Park and uh, was in Sydney for five years before moving to London. Uh, found out that you can't do horticulture in January because everything's frozen. Uh, then was in London for seven years and worked with the uh, Royal Household at Kensington Palace and Buckingham Palace and then was over in New Zealand for a few years running some private estates and then moved to Melbourne where we got into our vertical gardens which I've been doing for the last seven years and have recently moved back to Sydney. Uh, I'll let James introduce himself now. Yeah, but, um, I will add to that that Scott's helped uh, Melbourne University um collate their curriculum on greening buildings in cities. So if you've got any like question, big or small, I recommend picking at least his brain. But I've got over 10 years experience in um, golf course, um, garden management, um, landscaping, and also doing installing and maintenance uh, with fighter greens. So uh, I would be more than happy to get involved too in the answer as well. Um, but I am also curious about um, all of uh, your experiences because I do believe that nature is a funny one. You think you've got it in the bag and then it can uh, give you a little bit of a, a funny. And sometimes something that seems complicated uh, actually has a very simple uh, solution. So we're both very interested in what you, um, you know, have got to share today as well. Um, and we do want it to be a very engaging experience for you and also demystify um, the challenges that anyone can face with having a plant in uh, low light or indoor settings as well. So, um, yeah, back to you, Scotty, to talk about Phytogreen. Thank you. Uh, so Fido Green has been running since uh, 2002 and we are one of the industry leaders in uh, greening built structures in our roof gardens and vertical gardens. So uh, this presentation, I was just focusing on vertical gardens. I do have another one. So if anyone's interested in looking at some of our roof garden projects, uh, probably our most well-known project is a roof garden. It's the uh, Victoria desalination plant down in Wonthaggi. And that's the largest green roof in the Southern Hemisphere. So it's about 27,000 square metres. Uh, is a fun project, also a very challenging. Uh, we still look after it, so it's coming up to nine years. Um, but I can run through that a little bit later if you'd like. Um, we also have 45 staff nationally uh, across Sydney, uh, Victoria, Queensland and Adelaide. And we also have a couple of staff over in sort of Perth and also uh, in New Zealand. We work in partnership with a, another company over there. And recently Fiji, we uh, installed a couple of vertical gardens over there in the, um, the lounge for Fiji Airways, which I was looking forward to going on and checking, but this lovely lockdown has definitely stopped that. Um, yeah. I think that's most of us. Uh, and then I'll let James just talk about why we want to put gardens on built structure. Alrighty. Uh, I think it's apparent to all of us that the, uh, excuse the pun, uh, the climate around um, urban environments has definitely changed over the last decades. Um, and there's been a growing need to look at ways to buffer some of the uh, imbalances that can happen for the greater um, global environment um, and uh, social impacts that um, can be stressed upon in urban, setting, urban settings. Um, but to, I'm not sure if you, you probably can't see up there. Uh, we can send you any details as well, uh, if you're curious about any dot point or 
want to further reference anything, uh, please hit us up after. Um, but some of the things that you can't see on there um, around the circle there is the greening up buildings uh, improves the microclimate of the immediate surrounds. So rude. Sorry. <laughs> no, he's a busy man. We're lucky to have Scotty here today. Sorry. Um, it improves the property value and marketability of a building. Um, also, the, the fact that you're developing um, and urban spaces are expanding, you're losing biodiversity somewhere. So you have to, we have to somehow incorporate that back. So this is one way to do that. Um, interestingly, I'm not sure if anyone works in an environment where there's a lot of greenery, but it apparently improves workplace retention rates of employees and improves productivity. No sick uh, days here, is there, at Karoma? Uh, I know, well, that's here. It, it, like, welcome to Fighter Green as well. Like, whenever I'm angry or frustrated, these guys know too much. They just send me out to the plants and it's, it's just, like, they know too much. Um, all right, so it uh, obviously creates a more attractive uh, building and street setting, uh, which for local shopping centres uh, or local shopping streets really does... Um, create more visitability um, and local uh, shopping. Um, not to mention, which is probably the most paramount point in terms of my own experience, um, the social and mental well-being uh, effects of having greenery around. Um, alrighty, how do we do this one? Biophilic design. Is anyone familiar, other than the Coroma staff, uh, with the term biophilia? Yeah. Cool. Ooh, can you explain it to us? <laughs> 10 points, perfect answer. Yeah, really good. Um, so my understanding too, uh, that's exactly what I would say as well, um, that it's in capturing... Um, Humanity's affinity for um, the natural world. Um, it's really interesting. I don't know if anyone was here for Damon Gamow's um, speech earlier, but I encourage you to follow his uh, Instagram. Uh, recently on one of his feeds, he spoke about the Ashwa people uh, over in Peru and Ecuador, the border there, is a tribe that um, up until 1970, uh, no one knew existed. Um, and they don't believe in nature. They don't... They, to them, there's no concept, it doesn't exist that something outside of them is nature, like because they're just so immersed in, um, in that. So that's pretty cool and probably a concept um, to consider f throughout this um, slideshow today, I suppose. Um, but Eric Fromm was probably the first person to have coined the term. Why I like bringing him up is because he basically fled from Nazi Germany um, back in the day as a psychologist and uh, continuing his studies in America, um, he was really fascinated about how the environment, society and therefore the personality could influence someone's anxiety uh, and well-being. Um, so he was very much about our not only is do we have an, a natural affinity for the environment, but also the setting that we find ourselves in can be very influential to our state of well-being. All right. All right, so probably the first uh, resistant point that we get in uh, any talking about any project is that hip pocket nerve, how much <laughs> we're uh, willing to want to um, fork out on anything. Um, Obviously, I'm an, an animal, uh, plant and animal lover, so um, anything invested in that direction is always going to be tenfold for me. But there are actual um, substantial um, evidence to suggest that not only the value of a building goes up and the marketability, um, but the city as well has uh, growing, another pun, um, incentives for getting greenery into building spaces. Um, I would do yourself a favour and get onto the City of Sydney's website. Um, I think you'll really enjoy what you see there. There's, there's many grants available. Um, basically, 
In 2019, the city did a poll, um, or the government did a poll for the residents, and the, the alarming uh, consensus was that the city for the future that everyone wants to see is um, a, a greener city, one covered with plants and um, trees, and also a, an, a government that is environmentally responsible. So, how that translates for everyone here is that um, the local government uh, is willing to play ball with you if you've got some ideas. Um, Scott can elaborate this in a second with um, a project that we were involved in uh, in St Kilda East, down in Victoria. But um, effectively, I would just get amongst it to see what can happen. Um, this project here, you can see the photos. Now, this is in St Kilda East. Uh, this was a 19. This is a 1950s building which has been retrofitted. Um, so the residents there were really bored of having a whole roof space that was empty um, and got really hot and looked really bad um, and was just where they hung their clothes. And so these progressive thinkers, they got together and um, as they, they basically applied for different grants, the grants that they ended up getting was one for um, basically water conditioning or improving water quality um, back into um, the net stream there. Um, and then what was the figure that they got granted from the government? Uh, they got about 200,000 uh, worth of grants that they were able to then use to uh, build their roof garden. So it's a mixture of space of, they've got some organic areas for growing vegetables, uh, garden space and also some grass area. And then just also some hard ballast area as well, just making it a usable space. Uh, a lot of time when people think of roof gardens, they don't really think it's usable, it's just something that you can look at. But there are ways that you can incorporate it and mix in that area. So. Uh, it's a lovely space. If you actually go, if you look up 38 Westbury, there's a website there which basically details how they went through their whole sort of process. They're also happy to help if people are interested as well and really run through it. So especially, yeah, it doesn't mean that if you're in an apartment that you can't have greening. There's lots of different ways that you can go about it. Thanks, Scotty. Um, yeah, so I actually looked up um, and there, there's an apartment going there at the moment and the key selling point is the roof garden. So... Just a reminder on that. In terms of so if anyone's thinking of moving to Melbourne? <laughs> <laughs> Going for $700,000. <laughs> uh, all right, so this one... Uh, hmm. I want to term some stats that I am going to say as alerting because uh, I, for me, can have stats weigh pretty heavy on me sometimes, um, particularly, um, I suppose, the one I'm about to mention. Um, so, according to the World uh, Population Balance.org, which has a very imp impressive reference list there, um, our current rate of consumption um, of Earth's uh, renewable um, resources and also referring to the toxicity and waste absorption capacity of the Earth, we're using 1.68 its capacity to sustain our current population. So without anything um, changing there, uh, that's a little bit of a scary um, thought to hang on to there. However, um, as we've just discussed, uh, the, the whole setting that we're in now is that we have some of our slower moving cogs, being our government and et cetera, um, being willing to see what kind of things we can do to try and rectify this. Um, now, by 2050, it's assumed that 65% uh, of the world's population will be in urban environments. Uh, so to further um, address the environmental concern, um, when you have expanding uh, urban areas, you do lose biodiversity somewhere. Uh, you also get this um, heat island effect here that starts to happen. You get lower air quality. Um, and you're also at risk of diminishing uh, the population's connection, or at least in the urban areas, to nature, which is quite a pivotal point, which I'll come to shortly. You can see here um, the clear distinction of temperature difference. Um, one of the benefits of greening a building isn't just the fact that it brings uh, diversity and bird life and sounds and uh, insects back into the area. Um, 
That's about a 20 degree difference there on the outside of the building, which in turn can lead to lower energy consumption um, and also sound absorption as well. Um, also wind movement as well. Ooh, I like that. And on top of that, uh, any water runoff of the building is actually cleansed by the time it gets through it. Um, and it delays um, potential stormwater um, build up and flood points as well. I think that's a, a big factor that we look at now. I think with our changing environment, I think, you know, we haven't had rain for so long, then all of a sudden we have these massive downpours and then areas that are, are flooding because our stormwater can't, uh, can't really cope with those conditions. So looking at ways that we can try and control that, slow that down, you know, to only make you know, the cities a bit more livable and also because it costs so much money. As soon as you flood an area, it's just an exponential growth of money that it costs then to fix and repair and also the materials we have to use. Yep. Um... So I touched on just briefly uh, our connection to nature um, and our affinity for nature. Now, what we're at risk of doing without greening um, the developments that we've got in place is we are at risk of uh, putting us in a position of disconnection from nature, uh, which can have uh, health and well-being um, consequences. Now, an alarming... Uh, fact that came out of um, Kids Helpline with the recent shutdowns, uh, lockdowns in Victoria is that their um, intervention rate for youth suicides has tripled over the last year. Um, so that's a really sad fact. Um, conversely, people who live on uh, forest uh, fringes have been found to have um, optimally healthy um, amygdalas, um, the region in the brain that is responsible for memory um, and uh, emotions. So that's, that's the opposite effect of what being out in nature can have there. Um, Scotty, you spoke yesterday about the Kansas uh, University... Uh, state University. Yeah, so when we look about the healing properties of plants as well, so Kansas State University did a study with uh, post-surgery patients. So basically they took a, a group of uh, different patients and put them in uh, half the group in rooms with plants and half the group uh, without sort of plants and with different sort of control sectors. And they actually found that the people in the groups uh, with, the, um, with the rooms with plants actually healed quicker and used less pain medication. And when asked what their favourite thing about the room was, it was the plant. And they found that they were actually caring for it, watering it, moving around the room to get in the better light. While the people in the room without any plants basically said the TV was their most favourite thing. So, again, there's lots of different sort of benefits we can talk about the environmental, but just that sort of when we talk about biophilic, just that intrinsic closeness to plants and just, you know, not only does it make us feel happy, but it can also have, you know, make us heal faster. Um, have you heard of Amanda Sturgeon? Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 very cool. Anyone else heard of Amanda Sturgeon? Um, she's really cool. Um, check her out. She is an architect and also the author of um, the Living Building Challenge. Um, I really resonate with a quote that she has. Um, is biophilic design engages our um, happier, intuitive, and... This is all you. Yeah, I know. <laughs> um, I know you, this one. Happier, intuitive, and instinctive. That was the word. That was, that was one of the key words, too, I really liked. Um, aspects of ourselves. It engages that in us. And it is my direct experience of working um, in the garden industry. I have to admit, in my first couple of years working in landscape gardening, I really dreaded rocking up to work every day. And I experienced um, the natural world as itchy, heavy, cold, damp, um, boring. Uh, yeah. Um, you didn't say I, that during the interview. Yeah, no, I didn't. Um, however, now I find myself daydreaming about nature. I find myself um, like I breed butterflies now. Um, I I'm fascinated by nature's resilience, given half a chance. It's um, a vulnerability that it shows, the sweetness, and also probably the key point here is. I've really enjoyed its responsiveness. So if you get a plant and you've probably had it 
uh, a plant or seen it where it's looking a little bit weepy or like just tired and you give it a little bit of love or you give it, you know, just some basic water or just basic needs and to see it start to pep up again, like that's a good feeling. Like I, like I thrive off that and he kind of knows and now so it's like he will give me some pretty hard budgets on jobs to try and reach time frames, but he knows what I'll see it through. But anyway. Um, <laughs> you make me sound like a monster. <laughs> no, that's a good hustle, Scotty. Um, but I, um, I'll leave on this. I'll, I'll pass back to Scott um, because our beloved Albert Einstein um, with his quote, look deeply into nature and you'll understand everything better. And I think he just really encapsulates my experience of... Um, what capacity we have to uh, change our urban setting. So, thank you. Cool. All right, so now trying to convince you why putting plants on buildings. I think Jimmy did an excellent version there. We'll just like to run through like some of our projects that we've done. Uh, we'll show you some big commercial ones and then also look at some, some residential ones because uh, we've actually got some panels down here that are a couple of years old that are left over from projects but just showing that not only can you have vertical gardens on giant you know, commercial ones, you can have them in your own house and we can show that. There's some empty panels and plants so we can run through that a little bit afterwards. But really when looking at vertical gardens, um, the first question really to ask is where is it? Is it indoors? Is it outdoors? You know, there's, I always like to think if people want to put a vertical garden in, it's no problem, we can. It's just trying to answer a whole bunch of questions first so that we can make sure that it's sustainable and that it lives, you know. Really making sure that we have access for maintenance, you know, we can get water there, we can get water away, you know, looking at what your host wall is, you know, all different little factors like that. That'll really help you make the right choice for what you want to do. And then hopefully, you know, enjoy having some plants as well. So there's many types of uh, vertical gardens. Uh, being in the industry, we've definitely learned how to do things wrong uh, a few times before you learn how to do it right. Um, and saying that it's choosing the right system for you. So uh, you've got pot systems there. They're great little systems, definitely on a residential, especially really good for edible gardens where you want to change over your plants. Thinking long-term uh, sustainability-wise, for us, we try and stick away from that because when we design a vertical garden, like I'm hoping that it's going to exist for 20 or 30 years and we're trying not to change over the plants as much as possible. Like we, you know, potentially want to do maybe 1% to 2% per year. We're actually looking to have those plants grow and age with the wall and really sort of push it for as long as we have. I think our current, yeah, is one of our original walls, which is about 18 years and, you know, that's what we want. We want to keep that sort of happening. But, yeah, definitely if you you're, I know Bunnings, they sell some great systems. I'd love you to buy our one, but if you want, you know, really I just want greenery on buildings because the more that people do it, the more it builds the industry in its, in its own because there's a factor now with greening that if you get the wrong system then, and it doesn't work, then people go, oh, greening doesn't work. That's instant. It's not like buying a bad fridge or a bad car and you're like, oh, I just bought a bad brand, you know, and I, I need to do it again. People generally, they get burnt one spite, they won't do it again. So it's just understanding that. Um, now, there's a picture down the bottom there. I'll tell you about some of our failures because I like to say rather than, you know, it's, we've had that and it's how we learn from it. Um, did anyone watch The Block in 2012? I think it was Block Sky High. No? All right. No Block fans here. Uh, that's good. We're not working with The Block ever again. It was a horrible experience. <laughs> um, but it was five apartments uh, with little vertical gardens all around the building. Uh, great concept for selling the apartments and looking at it, but maintenance-wise, terrible idea because you basically had five apartments paying for the maintenance of this building, having to use an 80-foot cherry picker to do it. There was electrical permits, uh, footpath permits. It basically cost about 25 grand to look after those vertical gardens. Crazy amount of money, so especially split across five apartments. Uh, so that's what I was saying about choosing the right options. We want to put plants on buildings, but only if it's viable and only if it's going to last or people are going to be able to pay for it. So when putting vertical gardens in, you really need to think 20, 30 years. You know, if you're going to put it in, it's something that's living and breathing. You know, it's, you know, it's all alive. You know, it's like having a dog. You know, you just don't buy a dog and then don't feed it. You know, it needs continual sort of looking after it. So those are some things to think about. Um, then there's uh, a picture of the, uh, the Patrick Blanc system there, uh, which gets used. So it's also thinking about the right system for the right environment. Now, I don't think that system works well in an Australian environment just because it doesn't have the resiliency for our environmental conditions. 
um, to, to pull back. So in Europe, it works well. You get that, uh, that perennial feature where it sort of dies back. Um, but it's been used at one central, which unfortunately it hasn't uh, worked as well, which we can see currently at the moment, I think it's only about 20 to 30%. So it's a shame. Hopefully it's able to sort of come back. Uh, we can bring it back, but we're trying to look at, you know, when choosing a system, make sure it's, it's, you know, it's going to work within that environment. Uh, now, we try and push away from organics as much as possible. So pot systems use a high amount of organics, which is good when you're growing sort of edible gardens, but when thinking about longevity of gardens, you know, 20, 30 years, we don't really want to use organics because they continually need to be replenished. So we're looking for inorganic matter that's going to essentially try and outlast the plants. Um, and that way, if you actually see once, uh, we don't really use the foam as much. We've more moved to a felt system now, which is more about fire compliance, which I can get a little bit more into. But you can actually see you get the root penetration, you get air pericity, and yeah, that'll probably outlast us. Some of our walls will probably last longer than we live. Um, now, this is a project uh, loop, which is in uh, Melbourne. So this was part of the City of Melbourne's Urban Forestry Fund. So in the City of Melbourne, which is James brought up about grants, if you want to put a green project in, they will pay half if you apply for the grant. They'll basically pay for half the project, or if you want to double it in size, um, they'll add that sort of money on, and they're trying to push that to make sure greening's happening. Um, I'll show you a little video, and then I'll uh, run through a little bit more. So that video was filmed over two weeks doing that installation. It was actually pretty much three quarters was actually uh, doing the install for the, the infrastructure on the building. And so that's what we, uh, James sort of brought up with uh, 38 Westbury. Doesn't, greening doesn't have to be new buildings or new buildings that are going up. You can retrofit old buildings. So uh, that's in Myers Place in the city of Melbourne and it's a 100-year-old building, uh, double brick. Um, when we had a look at the building and got an engineering report, we weren't too sure if the actual brick structure would hold. So we basically had to do brick ties, basically where you drill through the two bricks, uh, can set a rod in there, which basically just binds the structure together. And then we were able to, to put up our sort of green wall there. Uh, so that's 40 square metres, uh, but has 80 different plant species in it. Uh, we've also really tried to pull back the maintenance on it as well. Um, more of a trial to see how cheap we can run things. So we do uh, two EWP visits, with, which is with a scissor lift a year, and then we feed our uh, fertiliser solution monthly, which we sort of play around with. Uh, the garden's doing great, and it's, again, us trialling, you know, how intensive does our maintenance be or how less intensive and how that can survive. Um. It's a bit tired. <laughs> <laughs> Are oh, the plants getting bored by us? <laughs> uh, now, this is, is uh, the Medibank building uh, in Docklands, Melbourne. So, two, 400, uh, two 200 square metre gardens. It uh, was installed in June 2014. We also have a number of roof gardens and planter boxes around the building as well. So, it's a, a full green building with lots of internal plantings as well. Uh, it's a real statement factor. If you ever get down to Melbourne, when you walk along there, you come up the street, you see this big greenery factor. 
um, especially on the other side as well. It's just green all around. Uh, we look after it with a, uh, a BMU. I don't know if you, it's called a building maintenance unit. You ever see anyone window washing or hanging off the side of a building in those tiny little metal buckets? Uh, essentially, we use one of those and just come all the way down to the ground. We visit this one uh, four times a year uh, with the BMU and we're monthly, which we just sort of tidy up the, the bottom of the garden. Being that it's next to Marvel Stadium now, uh, when the AFL games are on, people do love to come and take some plants home with them. So <laughs> provides a, a fun little challenge. I guess it's, look, I mean, if people are taking the plants, you know, it's nice, I guess they get to keep plants, but, you know, we just have to... Uh, that's more where our replenishment budget with that garden goes, but there's some amazing uh, Monstera Deliciosa, which you can see on the far right-hand side there that are climbing upwards of eight metres. We sort of pin those back in, but it's... Oh. Can I do a little interjection there? <laughs> Does anyone in the room, have they played around with propagating uh, cuttings? Yeah, cool. Um, if you want to do any cuttings here... Please don't let it be significant. <laughs> no, but... Um, Look how abundant this space is. Um, just a quick little side note again. Uh, I love propagating plants. Um, this here, oh, that's not the best one. The Syngonium. This bucket here is literally our, oh, we've got some cuttings left at the bottom of the bag. I oh, will chuck it in a bucket at the yard. Um, the amount of times I've topped up that bucket is probably twice over the last year. And so that's just natural sunlight and just water, nothing else. No even TLC, it's just, um, they're very resilient. Um, you can literally get away with just good sunlight, water and airflow, so. Um, Why James brings that up is that's how we actually replenish our gardens as well, uh, just through sort of general sort of propagation. We can take our cuttings and actually just jab them back in the wall and we will get that sort of root structure going in there. It's very simple. Yeah. I. Laz with Scott, uh, it can affect the appearance of a wall, um, but more so when you're going through a nursery, a garden nursery, I would say I do know some people that take cuttings at um, garden nurseries and I don't really encourage it, but um, in this setting, feel free, like, I hope you go home. With Only through us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, now, this is our largest garden to date installation. So this is our Tower 4. So it's 470 uh, square metres over 14 floors. So it's about 52 metres tall. Um, we're on a full reticulation system here. So it basically means that when we run the irrigation, we capture all that water bottom. There's a level, it's, the garden starts on level seven and goes up to level 20. And then on level six, we've got water tanks at the base there. We basically capture all that water. And then there's a mains top up just to basically cover, because we don't capture all the water because the plants do use some for their, for their root growth. And currently we're running that garden at about sort of one litre of potable water per square metre per day. So it's only using approximately 500 litres of water of usable, say, potable water. All the other water that we use, which is about uh, 2,500 litres, is just reused within that sort of garden. And it's, uh, for us, this has been a big statement piece, again, that you know, vertical gardens, everyone sort of brings up, oh, it uses lots of water. This doesn't use lots of water. The lights that are installed are LEDs. It doesn't have a high energy usage. So there is that ability to go big and be functional at the same time. Uh, what we would love to, I guess, eventually do with vertical gardens is looking at how to plumb in and use uh, black water, water, like proper water filtration. Um, that is coming along, but at the moment, everyone just loves pretty gardens. So that sort of goes up first and that pays for the research for us then to be able to look at proper black water filtration, which I think is that next step within sort of greening buildings, how they become a, like that, adding that extra function. Um, now, one of the challenges with this vertical garden, uh, you can see the size there, is it came in right about the time of fire regulations. So they've... Now the governments, or they've basically considered greening buildings can be a fire hazard. Um, probably only if it's dead, because then it's actual tinder, but you actually find that plants, when they're greenery, when they're wet, they're not a fire hazard. Um, but part of the fun of this is we have sprinklers all throughout the garden, and then if the garden doesn't have water within eight hours, uh, five fire trucks will turn up at the building <laughs> uh, to come and have a look at it. <laughs> Yeah, so we have a, basically a system was back engineered. So we have an alarm system if we lose water for two hours, uh, three hours, 
and then at six hours an alarm goes off in the building uh, which evacuates people and then at eight hours the Melbourne Fire Brigade gets called. So for us, we could turn this wall off for about a week and it would be fine. And it's even when they've done the fire tests on the, uh, on the panels when they've been wet, they haven't been flammable. But they've done tests based when everything's dry and it can, it's, uh, it's flammable or they've considered it flammable. So as part of that, that's why we don't are uh, moving away from the foam and we've now moved into a felt-based system. So it's, again, it's as much as, you know, plants can challenge us, you know, people can come up with other fun ways to find, to make it difficult, but it's a fun way to evolve. Um, now, this is up in Queensland. This is Botanica. Uh, this is now actually the second largest Queensland vertical garden. We recently installed one. So this is about 220 square metres, but we've now installed one that's about 410 square metres, uh, but is now fully compliant. Uh, we've developed a system. So again, people try to make challenges. So we found ways around that with our system. Uh, it's a, an amazing garden. So if you ever get up to South Bank in Queensland, we've actually got a number of vertical gardens around there. Uh, and ARIA, this was their first, uh, the developers, so basically uh, ARIA Property Group, they develop a building, uh, they bring their builders on, and then they actually manage the project afterwards, which is really great. So a lot of the times you find when uh, developers come on, they'll, they'll bring a builder on and then someone else will look after it. And that's where issues with cost of maintenance or you know what system they're putting in, that's where it can fall around. Where you have developers who are invested within a building and then are managing it afterwards, that's where correct decisions are made. Uh, so for ARIA, this was their first project. We've now done seven other projects with them that they're managing and they just want more and more greenery because they find the buildings sell about three times faster and they're also getting a lot more money for those buildings and the people are happier there. Uh, I'll just run through a couple of pictures. These are just some of the, the new installs that we've done. Uh, again, incorporating greenery into communal space for people to hang around just to have that calming effect, you know, again, you know, what would be a standard lobby walking through that would be boring, we actually find, you know, people are sitting there, they actually hang out. I don't know if you've, people live in apartment blocks where you have that initial lobby space. I don't think I ever see anyone sitting there. Everyone just walks through. When you actually have greenery there, people do hang out. It's, uh, it's really fascinating to watch. Uh, this is some other ones. Uh, that one at the back there is uh, at a gym, Total Fusion. And again, that's uh, another little sort of uh, install. So this is our recent install on the, uh, the right. So basically trying to look at fire compliance within sort of vertical gardens. So this is our largest one to date, which is, yeah, 410 square metres. But the, the area between those metal pylons is actually a gap. So it's actually, I think, 620 metres when you looked at it wrapped around. So that took us about four weeks to install. So I was up in Queensland a couple of months ago putting that together. Uh, it nearly killed me, but we got there. <laughs> Um, and we're really looking forward to seeing how this grows. We've got about 60 different species in that, trialling uh, a few different things and also, again, trying to strip back our maintenance as much as possible because that's the, the big thing when it comes to body corps is really, you know, making it viable for people as well that their body corp fees aren't going to be too expensive. Uh, again, these are some other insoles that we've done. Uh, Unfortunately, the Amex Lounge at Sydney Airport, we don't really get to see that much at the moment. It's quite quiet there. Uh, I think Jimmy went and saw it last week, which is the first time in about four months. Very overgrown. Uh, yeah, we, um, they're actually been pretty good there at Amex. Obviously, they're restricted in getting us in to a degree, but they, they've asked us to train their staff there just to maintain it in the meantime, which is... Actually, like to a degree, like it's it's a it's approachable, and that's where like when you think of you do it yourself, um, green walls at your house, uh, no matter how small, like it is approachable. Like if you get some basic um, principles, I've got some uh, some nice residential examples here. So these are some more of our larger commercial examples. But what does that mean, I guess, for you at home if you want to do your own sort of structure? So. This is a, a private residence, just in a, a small courtyard, uh, basically just using the panels that you have around here. Um, so if people want to, at the end here, get up, have a look. We've got a few more that you can have a look around just to have a look at those plants and we can even sort of show you how you would actually uh, plant those. So again, you can see just an outdoor space where if you don't have much garden space, just bringing plants in, how you can, you know, basically you're not taking up a footprint you know, but you're bringing that green space into an area. I mean, that's, the, I think, the best thing about greening an area is, you know, you're not sort of taking up room that would normally be used. 
so these are just the uh, the different types of panels. Um, again, I'll go. We can go through down there if anyone's interested about how to actually sort of plant the panels if they sort of want to do purchase them. It's probably a little bit harder up here. Um, essentially. That picture up the top there, that's what you start off with, a blank space, once you sort of hoist up the panels, and then that's what you can have afterwards. Um, when you have your, your plant, uh, we call them nappies, which are these, uh, these little felt pieces up here, because that's because we consider our plants little babies, so we like to sort of wrap them up and make sure their root systems are kept wet, and then basically put in the pockets and then left to grow. And then it comes down to how you want to care for that garden. Um, which is really, is anyone interested about hearing how to care for a vertical garden? <laughs> no? <laughs> All right, so Jimmy's like sick of me hearing this because whenever I talk about the first tool when it comes to, it, it, take this to any sort of gardening, your first tool is your eyes. You should be able to come in and look at something and tell if it's healthy or not. You know, you can come in and see if anything's yellow or if it doesn't have any sort of water. That's the first thing to go and have a look at. Your next tool is your hands. You can go in, you can feel, you can touch. Does it feel wet? Does it feel too wet? At the same time, is it sticky? Because uh, it's one of our big things is uh, pest and disease. And generally, if something's sticky, that means that a pest is uh, attacking it. So looking after Coroma here, even though it looks fantastic and amazing, we do have a problem with mealybug, which does cause us issues. Uh, our trees have got a bit of woolly scale and it's a, a constant battle for us, but we try and keep on top of it. And with that is just trying to use as low sort of toxic chemicals as possible and making sure that we're, you know, trying to be as safe as we can. Scotty, uh, do you want to um, describe <clears throat> the origins of pests? Like where, why do they come into a, a green wall environment typically? It's because they love to eat plants. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, that's true. I mean, they've got everything... We like to, I guess, what we think about with, uh, with urban green, it's like a giant honey pot. That when you look at it in the urban environment, you probably can count the species on your hands, maybe four or five. You know, there's a, there's a plane tree, there's a couple of grasses. But when you look at greening within an area, we're trying to maximise the amount of species within an area. So even if you have the most fussiest of pests, it will still find something that it likes to eat. And we're trying to find a balance of how can you basically keep the pests away, but also maintain a, a healthy balance. On a, a lot of our larger outdoor walls, we've been found that we can actually leave certain pests in there and there's natural predators that come in, but really recommend uh, eco oil and uh, neem oil. Great sort of products as well, just to safely control sort of pests and disease. And on that, uh, the more we do get a, a greener city um, and green up our environments, we start welcoming into the whole wind and climate in the air, uh, just the natural predators of pests that can get out of control. Um, like Scotty was saying, like on a lot of the council strips, they're not set up to have much uh, d biodiversity out there. So um, it is a little bit vulnerable when you like opening doors and like it, they j can just be airborne. Um, and it is a bit of a honeypot once they get in here. That it's like, so that's where, yeah, making sure you've got healthy plants, um, they're not weak from the get-go, uh, just creates a sense of immunity for that. Yeah, and sea salt. Sea salt is a, is a wonder drug for plants. And if you ever have a, a stressed out plant, um, you never want to feed, everyone likes if they have a stressed out plant, they want to feed it with heaps of fertilizer. It's the, the worst thing to do. I always like to think of if you have a stressed out plant, it's like an anorexic person. If you have an anorexic person, you don't take them to an all-you-can-eat buffet because it's just going to make them even sicker. You've got to find other ways. So sea salt is a great tonic to bring your plants up. Um, and then within a vertical garden environment, they will naturally cannibalise yourself. So if you think, if you do decide to put a vertical garden up there, consistent maintenance. It doesn't have to be crazy, but you just go in there and just do little trimmings, you know, because plants are going to cascade over themselves. I always like to put it, say, mowing grass. If you, know, if you mow your grass every week during summer, it's the easiest job to do. You leave it for six or eight weeks, it's going to take you about four times as long and it's going to look horrible afterwards. It's going to look all white and scalp. So whenever we look at, you know, maintenance of plants, is just consistency. And if you, if you keep on top of it, and that's really a, a big thing as well when choosing greenery for yourself, is how does it fit into your lifestyle? Because we all love to have plants, and generally I think the reason that plants die for people is that they just don't have the time to look after them. You know, we leave it a couple of weeks and all of a sudden that plant's dead. So I always like to sort of start off small, work out how your lifestyle is, and then, you know, you know if it's very easy to look after, keep sort of growing on that, you know, keep building. And again, it comes down to design uh, orientation. You can see here, um, 
with the plants down here, there would be a vulnerability for the bottom panels for um, the fern being above it. So if you didn't have something that was able to cascade down and grab the light that it needs, uh, all the light's being suffocated by the plants above. So um, there is that design element that comes into where you place your plants um, and how you, the interplay of imagining one or two years down the track, how do you imagine this to be mature and the whole system working together um, with the limited sources that they get. Does anyone have any specific questions that they'd like answered? Consultation process like with like key stakeholders like oh sorry with key oh sorry did you hear my statement before no okay uh, no. so my question was around um, green walls in residential areas yes so it was about like what's the consultation process like with like uh, stakeholders like you know the councils and like the community for their implementation and whether like so which kind of permits are applicable and so that's my question around yeah. Yeah, it depends on the, the project that you're, you're going to do. Uh, generally, if you're doing, say, a small sort of green wall, it's fairly sort of easy. Uh, I guess one of the complications that has come up is putting a green wall on a fence. Um, and if you're not capturing that water, if it's just running into a garden, depending on the slope of your property, which has come up, someone's put a green wall on their fence and they're watering it, then all of a sudden the water is running into their neighbour's property, which they get quite upset about. So... Um, on small residential, yeah, it's, it's fairly sort of easy. Again, local councils differ with their, of how they go, because some people have used green walls. You know, if you keep it to the height of your fence, it's fine. If you decide to put it higher than your fence, again, different councils, you know, you can only have fences so high and different regulations with that. Um, but really, if you're looking to say it's a new build and you want to put a green wall, it's just to start thinking about it as early as possible. If you try and do it afterwards, it just becomes more expensive. While in that initial design phase, if you're already thinking about it, it's so much easier. If you're wanting to look at drainage, you're getting piped in there. It's compared to say you build a house and then all of a sudden that's a great place for a green wall. You then need to run new piping, run new drainage. You know, it's, it's possible, it just becomes more expensive. So whenever I guess anyone's thinking about greenery, it's just that, at that first stage. And then contacting, you know, you can contact us, contact, there's other greening companies out there and we can sort of steer you in the right direction. Here's the things that you need to be thinking about. Here's council, you know, do you have some plans? And we can give you rough costings as well because Again, that's a factor as well. If you're going to put greening in, are you going to look after it? Do you want us to look after it? Those sort of maintenance costs because there's vertical gardens, but there's also green facades, which is like a vertical garden, which is you basically have a pot and you can run wires and you can grow plants up that. You get the same effect. It's, you know, not as, I guess, showy as that, but, you, you know, you still get the same beneficial effect. So, yeah, I guess that's... Mm. Be because... I. Because working with retaining walls, you've got to get council approval because you're actually making significant changes to the, the weight bearing of the land in the, the area. But because it's green walls and, you know, you're effectively planting up uh, yeah. with, with more structural integrity um, of the building finding its place. So it's more the person doing the building is probably already doing the groundwork. You do want to make sure that, yeah, like the load bearing capacity of the wall yeah. is there. Yeah. So you want to be savvy with that kind of... Because are you part of the design... No, no, no. No, I'm just like... Oh, oh yeah, okay. No, yeah, no, no really that's really all right. I'm trying that. to... But no, yeah, it, that, that, I think that answered my question. I think my question was more around as well, like a lot of buildings here in Sydney, well, I guess in Australia, are considered to have like a heritage value. Oh, yeah, cool. Like cool. I think cool. most of them, like for example, in the CBD area, like even though they've, they've only been, they were built like, I don't know, 100 years ago, like they're considered like heritage. So I know that a lot of like approvals will go through like do any kind of like, um, uh, yeah, anything new to those kind of buildings. Yeah, so, but yeah. Yeah, that comes into that design phase. There's, as I said, look, you could probably talk for days about different permits that need to be sort of carried on. And I think it's really a project by project basis. Uh, interesting, which wasn't a vertical garden, but we installed a, a roof garden last week. And that actually brought air rights in because the property next door owned the air rights across the next property. And that's basically, it's in Vaucluse. And they, it's basically building up and it's, so their, their view isn't taken away. So we were installing the uh, roof garden only on a 150 mil profile. The plants are only really going to get 300 mil. But the resident next door, because they own the air rights, caused up a giant fuss. 
because um, they were like, you know, how, how tall the plant's going to grow? Is it going to ruin my view? And it was uh, caused a, a few issues. We got there in the end, but again, look, that's something which we'd never really dealt with before. And, you know, it was very specific to that project. I mean, that's not generally something that comes up. Um, I don't know if you, there's another interesting one with the air rights. Uh, in uh, 60 Martin Place, uh, in uh, the CBD, on, uh, oh, what's, that? what's that road? I forget. It runs along the, the State Library, and there's, a, there's an old church there right next to Martin Place. Uh, Lendlease installed a building there, and if you actually go there, you can actually see it encroaches, and it moves slowly over the church. And I think it was $10,000 per square metre that uh, they had to pay for the land rights above there. Now, I don't know if it's per level or if it's just specific, but again, that, that just brings in another factor which is really sort of opening up this crazy sort of, you know, air rights on there. I know as well there's underground rights. Um, yeah, which, sorry, that's, that's going off on account. It. <laughs> no, you're welcome. You're welcome. So just a question about... Um when you're doing the, like a large environment like this, sorry, large yeah. environment like this, does, so in summer we fertilise and in winter we don't, but when you're doing a big environment like this and you've got sort of artificial heating and, and things involved, does that then change the sort of period that you need to fertilise and, and look after? Yeah, um, look, it, it can play around. Um, Say within sort of vertical gardens, uh, it's basically spring generally the whole time because you have artificial lighting. And so it's basically, you're not getting a difference within season. Uh, we can play around with uh, fertilizers, you know, to, to change that. And we sort of uh, feed each month and then we also flush and we use pH and EC levels. Uh, with an area like this, uh, this actually has no artificial lighting or anything. It's basically, this was designed with all the, the natural lighting. Generally, part of the design was actually having these sort of open spaces. And again, that was an energy saving cost. So we feed this in spring. So we use Osmocote, uh, which is a slow release fertilizer that we use, which is a 12 to 14 month uh, lasting and is a low sort of phosphorus. Um, now we do our EC and pH readings because the media that we've used in here is low organics. Again, because we want it to stay stable, we don't have to replenish it. So we check those readings and we, we play around with that. And we also, because the plants are in a low light environment, we look at that if they need supplementary top up. So that's where I say sea sol is great. You know, we could use sea sol, you know, every week here and it would be fine. Um, but you can use it just some extra nitrogen replenishments. And again, that comes down to looking at plants if it's an iron or nitrogen deficiency. Um, there's some really cool stuff coming out now, basically because um, medicinal cannabis, uh, there's a lot of hydroponic project, uh, products. There's a uh, Brexel, which is a basically all trace elements because a lot of the times when people fertilize, you know, it's not necessarily that it's, you know, we have MPK, which is nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Those are the big three. It's not necessarily a deficiency in those. It's a deficiency within the trace elements. And sometimes by adding the extra fertilizer of the MPK, you cause toxicity and you're not really dealing with the issue. So, you know, there's great things with using trace elements where you can sort of bolster up the overall health of the plant. And also uh, some really cool uh, enzymes that you can add to your potting mix, which creates the network for the root system to better absorb nutrients. Um, again, that's something we could talk about for hours. And hours. Yeah, there's just so much content. So thank you so much, Scott and James. That was wonderful.